Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Virginia Center for Creative Arts Fireplace Series. It's our pleasure to have you with us this evening and also to have two very special guests and former fellows at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts. Um, I, my name is Martin Hundley. I'm on the Fellows Council at the Center, and it's my pleasure to introduce both Ellen Princess Campbell and Marilyn Banner. And I'd like to just say a little bit about them um, before we hear about their work. Uh, Ellen Princess Campbell is the author of the novel, The Bowl with Gold Seams, uh, 2016 winner of the Indie Excellence Award for Historical Fiction, um, as well as uh, short story collections Known by Heart, 2020, and Constant Under Pressure, the 2016 nominated for the National Book Award. Her short fiction has been featured in numerous journals, including the Massachusetts Review and the MacGuffin. She's a member of the National Books Critics Circle, and her essays and reviews appear in the Fiction's Writers Review, where she's a contributing editor, the Washington Independent Review of Books, and the New York Journal of Books. Of course, she's a past fellow at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and her work has been recognized by many different publications, and she's presented to many different audiences far and wide. We're also joined this evening by Marilyn Banter. Uh, sorry, I'm Marilyn Banner. Uh, Marilyn creates paintings in encaustic, which is a mixture of beeswax, pigment, and resin. Her recent work references landscape and explores her personal vision of the natural world. Her approach focuses on the abstract qualities of line, shape, color, and texture rather than representation. Marilyn has always responded to visceral and spiritual qualities of material and place inspired by the philosophy of abstract expressionism, i.e. the importance of the inner and increasingly grounded in the natural world, Marilyn's art combines a joyful spontaneity, reflection, and deep responsiveness to nature. Uh, Marilyn and us are collaborators and have many things in common and many great stories to share with us this evening. So I'm very happy to welcome them both. Thank you for being here. And I think that we'll start with uh, Ellen, who uh, will have a, a brief reading for us this evening. Thank you both. Thanks, Martin. It's, it's really wonderful to be virtually back at VCCA and back with my friend, Marilyn. And, you know, writing during the pandemic for me has felt strangely like being at a self-imposed residency because there's been so much solitude and there's been no need to make excuses for not doing other things. And, and so actually it's a, it's a strange thing to have published two books within the year, the collection of short stories known by heart a year ago, and now Frida's song, which will, which will be published on Tuesday. And so they, in a way they've gone out into the pandemic void, but I've also found this a time of of a different kind of increased collaboration with fellow writers and artists, because suddenly we've been able to break down geographic distance and time zones and be together the way we are now. And I've loved that increased collaboration. I'm, I'm going to be reading a brief passage from Frida's song and Frida's song, honestly, just um, I, I just heard from a neighbor that our local independent bookstore had just mailed her her copy. It will be um, it will be officially published on Tuesday, and the beautiful cover of the Chamber Musicians is a painting by Marilyn Banner, and we'll we'll talk more about how how that collaboration came to be later but I feel like Frida's song is really a book I want to bring back to you VCCA because it was at VCCA during several short residencies that were sort of stolen time from what was then my primary work as a psychotherapist. It was at VCCA that I worked on several drafts of Frida's song and it was at VCCA that I first really began to hear the voice of the primary character in Frida's song. It's a novel that's inspired by the life and work of renowned psychiatrist Frida Fromm Reichmann. And Frida fled Nazi Germany in 1935 and settled in Maryland at the Chestnut Lodge Sanatorium where she worked and revolutionized treatment. It's a book that's about the art 
of psychotherapy. It's a book that also includes lots of music and lots of art. And it's a book that really is a product of residencies at VCCA. Now, let me read a short passage from the book. This passage is Frida speaking and remembering a morning in 1938. The book is told in three voices, Frida, and then the voice of a current day psychotherapist, Eliza, and her young son, Nick. Eliza and Nick live now in the cottage that was custom built for Frida when she came to the lodge in 1936 because the director of the lodge did not want to lose her to any competitors. At the time that Eliza and Nick live in the cottage, Frida has been dead many years, dead since 1957. But in this story, Frida's presence becomes a strong influence on both Eliza and Nick. And so three voices and two time frames braid throughout the story. But in this brief, brief passage, you will be hearing Frida's voice. It's a morning in 1938, and Frida lives in the cottage, and her dear friend, Gertrude Jakob, who is another German psychiatrist, a refugee also from Hitler's Germany. She was Frida's student, and she is an artist, and she is now living with Frida in the cottage. So this is a morning with Frida and her dear friend, Gertrude. I come downstairs, enjoying the smell of eggs and toast and coffee. Muni leads me to the front door, eager to play fetch with the paper. He gums it up in his soft spaniel mouth and brings it to Gertrude. She rewards him with a bite of toast. I open the paper. Nietzsche says, the man who does not lose his mind over certain things has no mind to lose. Gertrude, my hands tremble. I must tell her. I cannot protect her. A young German Jew exiled in Paris has killed a German official. All through Germany and Austria, they are wreaking havoc on Jewish businesses, smashing windows, stealing and burning merchandise, burning synagogues and schools. A surgeon I know in Munich arrested for the crime of being Jewish. We hold each other. The phone rings. I do not answer. Morning light glints on the silver coffee pot I purchased, filling out my life again with domestic objects, deluded into believing in the security of belongings. The thick raspberry jam shines like a dark jewel, like clotted blood in the crystal dish. Crystal knocked, the paper calls it, the night of shattered glass. We sit like a couple at Shiva. I want to cover the mirrors, pin a torn black ribbon to my lapel. I want to be with my foolish, stubborn mother, and I fear for her in her parlor in Berlin. I must work. I will not give that villain, that monster over there, the victory of taking away my capacity to care for those who need me. The sessions are my art for dark times. On this black day, my patient surprises me with empathy, one of my most disturbed, a true lonely one, deep in her schizophrenic's internal world, looks directly into my eyes for the first time. I am sorry. 
Do you have family there? How has she even known of the events? She has recognized me as a person, understood the implications of my name, my accent. Yes, our assumptions of the line between sanity and madness are so often wrong. I weigh my response. As an analyst, I must not burden a patient with my life, but I must reinforce her effort to connect. Her breakthrough comes out of this ugliness. That evening, Gertrude draws the curtains against the darkness. We hide and listen to the radio. We are together. I could not bear this alone. FDR says he cannot believe such a thing could occur in 20th century civilization. How naive he is, Gertrude says, tears streaming down her face. Or worse, I think, closing his eyes, selectively blind and deaf. He is summoning his ambassador back from Berlin to learn what was going on, as if he did not have notice, as if he did not know. I sit at the piano and play Mendelssohn until I go back to the hospital for rounds. I play the laments of a Jewish composer. I play. Gertrude and Rooney go up to bed. And I'll stop there and look forward to talking with you a bit more about Frida and the book later after we see Marilyn's art. Thank you so much, Alan. Wonderful. And as Alan mentioned, Marilyn's painting, Diamond Quintet, is the cover of this book, Read the Dawn. And so it's my pleasure now to turn the program to Marilyn Banner. Welcome so much. Great. OK. Thank you. All right. So I will start. Um, that was very moving. Ellen's piece was very moving. It reminds me of being at the Virginia Center and hearing people read after dinner and share their work. So uh, this is really an honor to do. Um, okay, I'm gonna start with something, this piece that I did right before um, I came to VCCA. My first stay there was 1992. This was maybe 1990 called Soul Ladders. And let me see if I can get this on just right. Okay. This was really early first visit to VCCA called Shin Number no. Two. And I have little stories about each one, but basically I brought um, two by four foot panels because that's what I could fit in my Nissan Sentra. Bought a lot of those to VCCA for my first residency. This is uh, a dream of circles on the earth. I do recall that back in 1992, I was worried that I was not actively, being an activist around uh, climate issues, which were already we already knew about. And I had this dream of uh, my hands over the earth and sand coming out of each one and me drawing circles on the earth. Some kind of healing dream, I think. Uh, those of you who are watching this, who've been to the Virginia Center or been to the Blue Ridge will recognize the source of this imagery. It's called Feathers for the Sacred Dance. This uh, installation, this photograph was taken at Virginia Center in the long thin room. I can't remember which, which room that is. One of the other fellows took this. This is Ladders of Light. I had started uh, a bit of this body of work before coming. Um, but I strung up those wires and, and um, made all of these pieces there. And what's significant to me is that I had the idea of light and ladders coming down from the heavens, I guess. Um, but I felt I played Hildegard of Bingen 
and the 4A quintet during the entire three weeks. And I, my sense was that um, the light of the place and that music were definitely co-creators of this work. So detail, another detail. Uh, this was a later piece, similar, um, but some, some work that I did after I returned from that residency. That was, I think, a 1995 residency. Um, these are pretty special to me. There's a couple of these. They were 2001, right after 9-11. I did have a residency, and the boxwood trees on the grounds of the Virginia Center were always haunting to me. I just, I love to stand near them. And I did a couple of paintings while there um, of those boxwoods. Maybe I'm zipping through this, I can't tell, but I have quite a few images. Um, this is drawing, mixed media, a bit of collage. Uh, the significance of so much of my work is actually connected to some aspect of Virginia Center, at least this early work. Um, one of my earlier residencies, another fellow told me that if there was nothing else I did before I died, I needed to visit Costa Rica. And eventually, my husband and I were able to go to Costa Rica. And this image is uh, of, inspired by a rainforest there. And I also started working with paper uh, after that for a couple of years. This was done at VCCA. Um, also, it's about, I guess, 20 by 26 for those uh, visual artists who want to know the size of these collage and mixed media inspired by the, so um, the Song of Songs in the Old Testament. I did quite a bit of work, uh, again, at the, at the Virginia Center. This is another one called Song of Songs. Um, so I'm going to go back a minute because I think 2003, I was at the Virginia Center and um, at lunch, someone came into the lunchroom and said, if you want to see what I'm doing, I'm cleaning up so you can come by my room during lunch. And I went across the hall and the person in there, I don't remember her name, I remember seeing her work on the wall, it looked a little like Rothko's paintings, and she was working with encaustic. And at that time she was cleaning her brushes with paraffin and working with this medium which was used hot. And I just thought it looked like magic to me. And I asked her how to learn and I was able to study the next year for a week intensively. And I started using uh, this hot wax medium in caustic. This is one of the, not the earliest, but one of the earlier pieces that I did in that medium, and this was done at BCCA. As this was done at home, but uh, inspired by the land there. So, uh, at this period, early 2000s, and especially when I was at Virginia Center, there were times that I went there when I really didn't know where my work was going, and maybe I was a little I just didn't know what I was gonna do there. But when I got there and just uh, slowed down and let myself be with the land and the environment and the energy there, which the place is full of creative energy, um, I started doing work like this. Uh, land, land landscapes, VCCA scapes. This is called Golden Waves. I don't think I could do work like this uh, in the city. But when, I, well, I can, but I didn't. <laughs> this was when I was there at BCCA. And this one also, this is called, I Listen With All My Heart. It's from a poem. Mysterious Boxwoods. All of these are encaustic on wood. This is called Autumn Light, Blackfish Creek. Um, by this time, I was doing work that was 
land inspired and this um and i'm and i would just um work with images of places that spoke to me deeply had a kind of magic to them then my work moved into i guess we would call waterscapes this is called i think these were all uh several of these were from seeing a particular time that I was at the tip of Provincetown on Cape Cod. There's actually an encaustic conference that happens in Provincetown every year. Not this year, but every other year. And I looked out at the water once and uh, I think I spent two years, two years after that working with water, at least. It's another one, P-Town something like P-Town 19. It was a little kind of offshoot. I was really into water then, water everywhere. Uh, the water eventually, those pieces and my subject matter morphed into uh, what I saw on beaches. Sand, sea fans are impressed into there. Can't remember the title of this. This is about 24 by 24 inches encaustic on wood um just inspired by gazing down and being on a beach i i have to say doing this talk is amazing i'm getting to look at my own work and think back and it makes me recall that i grew up in st louis and never saw a beach until i moved to the west coast really and have visited other beaches it's you might not know it, but this is also sand inspired. I think it's called Sea Stars. This is the title, Tide Pools Sit Like Silent Trapped Galaxies. Coral Symphony. By the time I uh, did this painting, I was, I want to say there's a way that I was working where I, I felt like I almost became the water and the sunlight and the waves and the grains of sand. I was trying to do it all. I was trying to put all my sensations and together and then see how they came out in, in this kind of flowing um, sunlit water expression. Um, moving from beach sand there and water this is called big bear big bear three i visited some uh a place in california and this is uh one of the big rocks there again i was working with what really spoke deeply to me and the rocks and stone at that time um just a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, that was happening. Um, we went to Barcelona, just 2019, I believe, or mm, 2018. And the stone, that's what I was hearing. And uh, we were in an old section of Barcelona, actually in the Jewish quarter of the old section. And there were stones, there were walls there that I just stood next to and kept my hands on. Uh, the feeling was very strong to me that came off of those stones. Very, very ancient stones. This is another one of those. This is a photograph of lichen on a wall in Barcelona that when I looked back at, uh, moved me to working with, um, I won't say this is lichen, but it's inspired by. And I am still now working with growth, um, something about the lichen and lichen in general, the way it proliferates and grows and grows on top of each other and uh, has sometimes so much texture. This is called snow lichen. I've been noticing, especially during the pandemic, since we walked around and walked around and walked around this neighborhood, it, I'm in Tacoma Park, Maryland over and over that um, 
what I was soaking up was what grew on trees and what grew on rocks. And it wasn't yet spring. This is a close up of that previous painting. It's a little more recent. These are all from the last year. All, I guess, it, people call them pandemic paintings. I, they're, they're during this time, during the time when um, I wasn't traveling far and wide, but uh, was walking a lot in my neighborhood. They're not literal, obviously. They are, uh, you know, inspired by my experience. And then I call it internalized. And then what comes out when I'm working with the concept and idea uh, is what you're seeing here. Once I started with that encaustic in 2004, again, from seeing someone in at VCCA, uh, that has been my medium. These look like wild takeoffs, but they're still coming from the same source. I have no idea how far I am close to the end. This is next to end. This is very recent. Again, it's, uh, it's what's happening when I put my mind, kind of the back of my mind, together with this concept. Uh, I want to say it doesn't totally have words, and I don't really know where my work is going, I often don't know where it's going. So there's a lot of trust involved here. Uh, this is also recent, and this is the last piece I'm showing you. Thank you. That's the end of mine. Thank you, Marilyn. Thanks so much. You're and welcome. So what I'm most looking forward to is a conversation between the two of you. I know that you have, that your friendship is very rich, has a rich history. And when we were corresponding about this event, you said to me in 2009 at BCCA, you remet. And I was wondering if you could tell me about that. What you mean by you remet 2009? Well, as I remember it, and this is going to be fun because it may be that Marilyn remembers it differently, but I remember that probably it was at breakfast and I had never been to VCCA before and I was. I was the new the new person at the breakfast table, and and as we introduced ourselves, Marilyn heard my name and she said Campbell, and I guess we had had we established Marilyn that we were both from Maryland. Uh, who knows? But she said, "Was your mother Nell Campbell?" And at that point, for me, I I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Because my mother had taught with Marilyn at Green Acres School. And I, I was not at Green Acres School as a student, but I know that I had seen you and even heard of your work from mom who talked about going with other teachers. She did. She did. <laughs> Since we're talking but, about But is that how you remember our sort of connecting the dots? I remember you coming to, I had heard your name and your brother's name from Nell. Um, as a background, I taught at Green, this Green Acre School is a wonderful um, progressive private school here in this area in the 70s. And, and Nell Campbell seemed like I thought she had uh, was one of the founders of the school. I don't know if she was, but there was that feeling. And, uh, and I taught again there later in the 80s and early 90s. So I had heard Ellen's name and I think I had heard that she was a writer and and I don't remember what meal it was, but there was this person sitting next to me at one of the VCCA tables. And I think you were talking to somebody else. And I and then you turned to me and I think I said, what's your name? You said, Ellen Campbell. And I said, are you Nell's daughter? Like that, you know, I'm so, <laughs> more impressed that I was meeting Nell Campbell's daughter at the VCCA. So that that's my memory. I don't remember having met you before. Well, but then I do remember that for me, I began to remember things like when I was a camp counselor at Green Acres Camp, I feel like maybe your husband Carl was driving one of the camp school buses then. Um, you know, just sort of that vague memory began to float into my mind. And then um, I so remember at that residency, the open studio night, when I got to go into your studio and just that smell of the wax for the encaustic is so rich. And, and I think it's one of the things I love about VCCA is, is certainly what happened 
or happens for me in Maryland that here we are working in totally different art forms. And yet there's a way in which there's, there's just this openness of collaborative spirit and, and wonderful things happen. You know, like even just now when you were talking about your art and, and you said that you listen with all your heart when you're, you know, and I was like, that's it exactly. Cause I feel like for me, when I'm creating characters, I'm listening with all my heart, just the way I used to listen to clients in psychotherapy. So I just feel like VCCA pulls us together across disciplines. And then of course we were lucky in that when we went back to our other lives, we could still see each other because Marilyn lives in Tacoma Park and I lived at that time in Rockville and Marilyn and her husband Carl opened their home on a regular basis for Carl's wonderful Musica Viva concerts and my husband and I started going to those concerts which were such a beautiful way to continue that VCCA connection. Amazing. So Marilyn, what gave you the idea to start a chamber music series at your home? So it wasn't my idea. It was my husband's idea. Fair <laughs> play. Actually started in my art studio. I had a half of a warehouse art studio for many years. Uh, and in 1998, we start, my husband started a nonprofit called Washington Music Aviva. And what's interesting in, in terms of that, I had been going to VCCA for years by then. And when we started that in my art studio, um, we had performance artists, we had people from VCCA come and read and perform. I can't remember the names of the people. If my husband was here, he'd remember some of the people, but we definitely had people that I had met at VCCA come in and it was basically started as chamber music, but we also had poets, performance artists, and other uh, visual artists. So that was a long time ago, and uh, Music of Eva is still happening, and now the main place it happens, especially when the pandemic is not happening, um, is, is live music and live people in a music room that's an extension of the home we live in in Tacoma Park. They're actually doing live streams. And Ellen, we actually had Ellen read. You read from your book last year or so, right? I, I read um, I, I read from The Bowl with Gold Seams, yeah. my first novel. And then, um, you know, my, my collection of short stories, Known by Heart, came out during the pandemic. So I haven't had a chance to bring it to you. And then, this, you know, this I, I certainly will bring Frida's song to you because I think the cover, the story behind the cover is is connected to to Marilyn, of course, because she's the artist whose picture became the cover. But part of what I love about going to concerts at the Banners is seeing Marilyn's beautiful art on the walls. And I, um, I've had the experience once of seeing a painting in the coat in the bedroom where coats were being piled. And something about the scene looked familiar. It's not the painting that became the cover for Frida's song, but something about the scene looked familiar. It was beautiful, white birch trees going into a pond. And my husband and I both liked it very much. And sometimes, the most of the time at Marilyn's, the art is for sale. But Marilyn said, oh no, she said, that piece is not for sale. She said, that piece, that piece is called Habitat. I play, I painted that at a place in, in the Boston area called Habitat. And I did a double take and I looked very closely at the painting and I could see the title was Habitat, August 1980, August 1980, because my husband and I had our wedding at the Habitat Sanctuary in August 1980. So ever since then, Marilyn and I both felt as though she might have been painting at the wood in the woods while we were getting married. And and uh, to jump to the end of the story, a couple of years later, she said, "You know, if you really want that painting, and I really wanted that painting, and it hangs above our bed now." But then um, the story behind it, Frida's song becoming becoming Marilyn's book as well as mine is. 
Art and music are terribly important in, in Frieda from Reichmann's life. And her good friend, Gertrude Jakob, was a painter. And I, I thought, well, maybe we could have one of her paintings. But the, the gallery that held the few paintings that are available of hers was not open to that. And then suddenly I remembered again at one of the Banners concerts that in the stairwell, as I remember it, Marilyn, not in the big music room, but maybe as you go to the stairwell, mm -hmm. there were one or maybe two beautiful small paintings of musicians, probably Carl and friends playing music. And I can remember calling you and, and telling you what I was remembering and what I was looking for. And you immediately responded I remember you immediately responding and sending me a whole slew of possibilities. And that was so fabulous. Amazing. It sounds like an after dinner salon at VCCA. It sounds really fun. Well, you know, that's part of what inspired, as I was saying, you know, when we started Music of Eva, um, the VCCA experience of these fire, what we're now calling fireplace series, the after dinner things definitely was an inspiration. Um, we even did events. We did a couple of events where we just let everyone share. You know, we did yeah. a talk tour. So we just had 20 people sharing their creative work. Um, so, you know, anybody who's been to Virginia Center, the experience just it's like dropping a pebble in water, right? It just goes out and out and out and out. So uh, it's just, Amazing. it's such a pleasure to be on this this series and get to I share. Also, I want to invite anyone who's with us right now to, to put any questions or discussion uh, prompts that they might have, anything that they're thinking about in the chat. Um, and I wanted to mention, I read a, a piece that, a brief piece that Ellen wrote uh, called Many Things Are Wonderful that was about a teacher and choreographer, dance teacher at Green Acres, the school that you mentioned. Her name is Sally Nash. I believe she was a common friend. And I was wondering if you could tell, tell me a bit about Sally. That's another one of those magical links between me and Marilyn. Sally was my sixth grade teacher. You're right, Martin. And I did write a piece for her that it, you, you can find the link on my website. Uh, but Sally was a dancer and a choreographer and just an inspired teacher. And, and Sally was really the person who made me start believing as an 11 year old that I could write. You know, I looked back at my diary that I kept the year I was in Sally's class, Marilyn. And, and I, I very confidently in my diary at age 11 write, I will publish a book next year and like <laughs> write, you know add about 40 years to that and maybe you'll publish a book. But before I even knew Sally, Carl and Marilyn and Sally were friends and and she, and you all lived together, didn't you, for a time? She, she lived in the basement apartment of the house we had in Tacoma Park in the 70s. And she introduced me to Green Acres, that's what the, Funny part was that's what brought you. Carl, really forgotten me. <laughs> Carl drove the Green Acres school bus, and I was introduced to the art teacher. And when the art teacher retired, she gave me her job. Oh, I didn't her. know that. That was yeah. Sally's doing. And then Sally had had founded a workplace for choreographers, which was sort of like a mini VCCA, but just for dancers and choreographers. And she lived there, and it was in Rappahannock County, Virginia. So whenever I was at VCCA, either on my way down or on my way home, I would stop at Sally's. And sometimes if she didn't have a resident troop staying there, I could spend the night in the house that she had built for the dancers. Um, but, it, but she was such a, although she was never at VCCA, I feel like her spirit is, is definitely that VCCA spirit too. What a testament to teachers and, and artists and, and yeah. art teaching artists. Absolutely. I was wondering before, I know that we're close to the end of the program, so I was hoping each of you could say a little bit about what you're working on right now or what you see, uh, what you see happening with your work in the coming year. Uh, I can start because I don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> 
I am I am doing some um I did say that the encaustic conference that used to happen in Provincetown is actually happening online in a couple of weeks. And um, I guess I don't really know where my work is going, but I'm hoping that it, uh, I'm planning to soak up some new, not, not um, ideas of subject matter, but possibly some new additions to media or expansions in my work, but I really can't tell where it's going. Well, you know, I, I don't quite know where my work is going either. And right now, of course, a lot of my energy feels like it's going into just this, you know, this, this effort to, to, to launch my book. But, but I think I may have some conversations with Marilyn as I work on my next project, because I had, I have started another novel and, and this novel is inspired by a small school of landscape painters in Western Pennsylvania who were, who were in their time well known in that part of Pennsylvania. And I saw one of the paintings by the founder of the school years ago. And I just, I could have just walked into that forest landscape. And, and his work is all about water and stone and forests wow. and light. His daughter became an artist. His granddaughter became an art critic. And there's a lot that I don't know about them, which is perfect for me, because I like knowing a little and making up a lot of the stuff to fill in the blanks. But I'm going to need to know a lot more about what it's like to be a visual artist. So I'll camp on your doorstep. Great. Do some research. Well, I hope that both of you have occasion to visit BCCA soon, especially now that things are opening up. And um, I know that BCCA has an exciting season ahead of them. And I hope that you get there soon. Um, I think I think you're both in this in the same part of the country, like Maryland and Washington. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank it's you. really nice to be in conversation with you, and it's good to see you. Um, Thank you. And thanks to everyone at VCCA for making this possible. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing your work, both of you.